really good one. Uh, so it will take a little while to get through. Then we'll do a bit of a review, uh, talking about what you should all be expecting on Friday. And just in case I forget to mention it 27 more times, the exam will not start at 8.30 as it says on the sheet. That's our time slot. We'll start at 9.30. Can you get here by 9.30 or Yeah, I'll, I'll, leave, oh, okay. I'll leave at 7. <laughs> um, I mean, we could make it 10. Oh, no, no. Would, would 10 be even better than 9.30? Or you don't care? 10 is good. 10 is better, but 9.30 is not bad. Yeah, okay, let's go 10. 10 o'clock? Uh, and some of you I know will show up at 8.30 because you want to listen to what I was saying, so you can just sit around for an hour and a half. So anyway, I just, the, the, um, the last of the great artists we're looking at, and he's a total superstar, is this fellow Hans Holbein the Younger, so just very quickly reminding you of the best of the best in philosophy. Well, Robert, but he, make, he does make a good comparison with Dura, because Dura is such a... Um, arrogant bastard, in a good kind of way, but he's so full of himself, all those self-portraits where he's preening and peacocking and things like that. And along comes Holbein, he's just this rather modest looking fellow. Uh, and don't forget, it's still, certainly in the North, still pretty rare to do a self-portrait in the first place. But also remember what he said, he, he signed up Johannes Opinius Hans Holbein Basiliensis, which means Holbein from Basel. Which, if you're British, you don't like that. And I don't think he's German, born just before 1500, uh, studies, or well, works in Basel, studied with his father, remember, uh, then goes to Basel in Switzerland, which was at that time a great humanistic center, and meets people like Erasmus there, that's so important for his career. Uh, goes back a little bit, we saw him arrive in England, pops back to Basel for a few more years, then back to England for the rest of his life. Dies really quite young mid-40s, in 1543, uh, but from most purposes, certainly for my purposes, his importance is what he does in England, because again, as I was saying, there are no good or seriously good visual artists in England, because don't forget, by the time he's born, 1500-ish, already sort of getting into the high renaissance, Leonardo's cranking the mind, Raphael's going strong, Michelangelo's a, well, he's, you know, he's, he's done the Pieta in Rome, you'll get around to David in a minute. So every other country is going gangbusters. In England, I think I mentioned last time, they really got to wait till the 18th century before you get good native-born artists. Because they waste their time writing plays and things people like Shakespeare. So uh, the visual arts rather get stagnated. But as, it, as we saw, he arrives in England. First of all, the connection between Erasmus, who really was probably the most significant theologian slash philosopher slash voice of moderation in the earlier part of the, of the 16th century, trying to get everybody calmed down, all these Protestants fighting against Catholics, uh, but also very much, as we saw, involved with um, editing the, all the writings of St. Jerome, and that was kind of what brought the two of them together, because Holbein illustrated uh, Erasmus's books, and it was Erasmus's advice that he should go to England, because the, the, the arts and Basel was sort of freezing, as they said. Uh, and so he at least he had an opportunity in England. And uh, as we saw, the main patron protector is Sir Thomas More, M O R E, who is on a par with Erasmus. Really, he's the guy who invents utopia, uh, you know, the ideal state, sort of like Plato, Republic, but you know, modernized and has all these weird ideas about education, that women should be as well educated as men. I mean, that was unthinkable at that time. Women weren't supposed to even read or write. Quite a lot of them did, but you didn't have to, because basically your job was to get married and have babies. It's not bad. Well, no, not really. Uh, so anyway, this was a unique individual, and he looks after Holbein, introduces him around, but then, and this is 1527, remember, this extraordinary portrait in the Frick Collection in New York, which for my money, would, if I had any, would be one of the... Uh, I, I mean, I think this is just so good. And it, I mean, it's pretty good in the reproduction on the wall, but you have to go to New York, uh, do the whole Frick Collection thing, and this will 
be the one maybe that sticks in your memory more than anything else. There's just something about it which is what is so memorable. And it's all do you remember what I was saying about Hobbin was that he he benefits from the fact that first of all he's a northerner. Uh, so he inherits the technical tradition of Jan van Eyck of oil painting. Because the Italians they, they were doing it, but not nearly as much as in the north. They hadn't kind of, they were still doing more tempera perhaps and um, I mean, they're moving into oil, but not in that kind of finessed way that the Northerns were doing it. Uh, and while they were still painting a lot of murals in Italy, and murals were never really caught on to the same extent in the North. So you have, you have this sort of meticulous, very similitude, that's today's special word, uh, you know, the truthful way of showing all these wonderful uh, textures of the fire and the uh, you know, the, the, what would that be? Sweet? Not sweet, no, not sweet. Sort of, um, anyway, so, something expensive for sure. And then the gold of the uh, of the pendant around his neck. Remember I said nobody knows quite what S, 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 S means, but maybe something about Subon, Masubia, I always remember, sort of loyalty to the king. And the that little, I just know that little Paul Callisey thing there, that's the, well it is now anyway, it's the symbol for the city of Westminster, which is kind of downtown core of London. The Tudor rose, the tank. Remember all the way back to the, apart from stubble, which is, you know, seems everybody, nobody seems to bother to shave back then. Uh, remember, remember Van Eyck's self portrait where he had that little fleck of white, the little sort of undershirt of his neck that kind of held the head up a little bit. It's rather similar here, isn't it? Look at that. If you sort of block that out, the head sort of falls into the fur collar a little bit. Uh, velvet, that's probably what that is. Oh no, well, certainly that's velvet. Look at those sleeves, like I said, they're just on fire. That's wonderful. And then he's incredibly good at hands, eloquent hands. Um, men carry memos, women carry flowers and fans and girly things. Yeah, it's wonderfully sexist the way they did these portraits. Everybody had their role to play. Uh, and it's all about the stare, that incredibly baneful stare. And as I said, with hindsight, you look back on him as being the martyr, because he was executed for, because remember, he, he uh, opposed the king's divorce, as from which was basically part of the split from the Catholic Church in Rome, and was executed in 1535, sainted later on. It's not quite the right word, but... Um, he is actually St. Thomas More. So now we see something in that gaze of a sort of doom. It, but, you know, it's, it's quick and correct, everything was just going fine. He's still got a couple of years, then he's going to be Henry Chancellor. He's a rising star in the bureaucracy, basically. Uh, this incredibly learned, intelligent man, the center of this whole um, society of clever people. I mean, everything's just going fine. So, again, it's in high time. I said about, uh, I'm sure you, I hope you know some of the Van Dyke supporters of Charles I. We all see him as the Marte King laying down his life for his people. Rubbish. As I said, he never even met his people. He didn't give a damn about his people. Uh, but through Van Dyke, Van Dyke's eyes, we see him in that particular almost Christ-like uh, light. So this is, again, with hindsight, looking back on these things. But it certainly is true, you could compare Holbein to Van Dyke, because here, again, Van, Van Dyke comes around uh, 1630 or so. Uh, there aren't any that good painters in England, so he uh, kind of raises the bar to unimaginable heights. So we now see all of that era of Charles I, the sort of the cavalier poets and all those characters, all rather refined and elegant and, and totally out of touch with any sort of reality but beautified by Van, Van Dyck. He give, if it had been just nothing but English artists, they're not quite stick figures, but almost. And then a hundred years earlier, Holbein's done it almost exactly the same thing for the time of Henry VIII. We, we know these people because of him. There wasn't even anybody remotely similar that could have presented that. And you could also, I mean, you could add in, say, Velazquez, same with, with the court of Philip the set of the Philip IV of, of Spain in the 1630s, 40s, 50s. And it's all smoke and mirrors. I mean, none of these people were exactly like they paint them, but that's why it's good art. So that was him. And then uh, gradually, as we saw, he goes back to Basel, comes back to England, and 
his ambition essentially is to work for Henry VIII, finally gets that job after doing some things like this, which as I said were sort of almost like um, billboards uh, to show off his skill, this wonderful detailing, this occupational portrait of this German march, remember the, 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 the German connections with various sort of same thing that Dura found in Venice, uh, good for business. And this young chap in here who's just about to get engaged and all the, every single thing, there's nothing here by accident, everything actually means something. And like in religious art, it just expands the meaning of the picture. So he would have been a, a, a useful tool in a way, I guess, artistically, because he wasn't that important as a person. This chap here, again, not to go on about him, he had a job that, he was well connected through his father at court. He had a job that connected him to the German merchants. So again, Germans to the court, basically. And that's eventually where Holbein does arrive as the first painter to the king. And, and see, every, every noble, either ruler or aristocrat, they all had little stables of artists and musicians and poets and philosophers. That was part of your... Uh, kind of noblesse oblige, if you like, to support the arts in all its various forms. Uh, and, and usually, as we saw, you know, they were fairly low down the social scale. They were just part of the entourage, basically. Uh, but certainly there was a great deal of respect for Holbein. But this is, as I said, the one remaining image that is actually really all by Holbein. It's in the Thyssen Born and Music Collection in Madrid. But the, the studio works and or copies, because this becomes the way to show the king, this incredible, I'm pretty sure this one's in Liverpool, where you get the full length standing figure, I mean every inch a king, uh, arms akimbo, I think that's akimbo basically like that. But don't forget you've also got, uh, in one hand gloves, which is humanistic scholarship and learning, in the other hand you've got a dagger, which is obvious. So you've got the kind of thinking and the doing that division between active and contemplative that we've been looking at quite often. An absolutely splendid robe, but look, I mean, how wide can shoulders get? I mean, I don't think if you took his clothes off, he'd be quite that broad. But it does give him this extraordinary presence, this magnificence, uh, and, and the, the pompous way that the, the legs are wide, so wide. I mean, nobody stands really with their legs that far apart. Unless they have, just a couple, they might, you might have some sort of, Scratching disease, as it were, because look, he's got this enormous cod piece here. So maybe something's going wrong in here that makes him stand. Nah, can't get too practical about these things. Uh, but I mean, the, the, they weren't exactly big on hygiene back then, as I'm sure you know. I mean, the James the First, who comes sort of three kings after him, was. Uh, it was said that he, he gobbled when he ate, he slobbered when he drank, and he wore his clothes about three sizes too big so he could get in for a good scratch, you see, because they're all covered in fleas. That's why people have shaved their head and wore wigs, basically, with all the licensing that they had in their hair. Are you enjoying this lecture so <laughs> Yeah, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> so, cause we, we, we see them all kind of deified and glorified, but the reality, they were pretty smelly. And, yeah. Okay, so anyway, that's the king. So he's doing well there, and actually the other one, just to show you, because this is an original, the cartoon, because I'm going to bring this back in a second, uh, for, a, for a mural uh, in Whitehall Palace. That was just, the Whitehall Palace burned down in the 18th century. So all of this is gone, but the cartoon, for half of it at least, with Henry VIII and his father, Henry VII. And again, the distinction between the two poses, I pointed that out, that, you know, macho men in the foreground are rather feeble in the background. It's not very kind to put on Henry VII, almost sort of propping himself up on this Clinton thingy. And then the wives over here, just a little bit pushed to one side somehow. Anyway, so that's him being king of the world, as it were, artistically. And I mentioned the fact, and I, just to, not to get back into it, but no, I don't have any of them here. Uh, just to show you, this one drawing, because the uh, when he did die, unexpectedly, died of the plague in 1543, because he was the king's painter, and he didn't, I guess he didn't have any immediate heirs, because remember he dumped his wife back in Switzerland, uh, the king took possession of everything that was in his studio, and they got this extraordinary series of drawings, these portrait drawings, uh, which again are unique, or as I've said several times, usually when you did the painting, you threw out the drawings because it was of no value in its own right. But some, somebody obviously appreciated it. Not completely, because uh, they kept sort of trading them off with other people. I think it was Queen Charlotte or somebody 
found them in the whole box of Holbein drawings in the bottom of a cupboard, or you know, this sort of almost accidental lack of appreciation. But certainly nowadays, these are the, some of the stars of the Royal Collection. But also doing what I was pointing out that, that to transfer the drawing to the canvas or the panel or the wall, you prick along the outlines, and then you get you remember you get your bag of dirt, pounce, pounce, pounce. It's called pouncing. Transfer the drawing very, very accurately. You've also sort of ruined the drawing, I suppose, in some people's <laughs> eyes, but when you know that it is part of that process, I think that would almost somehow add to the appeal in a way, to something useful as well as something beautiful. So, anyway, now uh, he's doing very, very nicely at court, painting all these courtiers as well as the members of the royal family, all those wives who are being sent on trips to paint prospective brides to Henry as he's running through all these poor ladies to try to grab a hold of a son and heir, because if you remember Anne Boleyn, no, not Anne Boleyn, the next one, Jane Seymour finally has the book, The Future Edward VI, but he's very sickly and poorly, and so you need another one, so that's what never happened. Anyway, the one, the one I want to end up with is my, I mean, it's a good way to end the course, really, because it's such an amazingly strong picture. And for this, you have to go to the National Gallery in London, and when you do, you will be blown away, because it really is one of those quite extraordinarily grand pictures, apart from the It's about, it's about, well, it's about a bit over two metres square, so seven, seven feet square-ish. So you've got pretty much life-size figures, if they're not too tall. And it was painted in 1533, so in fact, I jumped back a little bit, so this sort of goes in with the idea of that portrait of the fellow in his office, Georg Geiser, that this is an advertisement for his talents. Because, you know, you have to show that you can do it. To, I mean, I would, I would imagine maybe even the members of the court, even the king himself, might have had a look at this before they actually hired uh, Holbein to, to be the court painter. And in fact, it was, this is rather interesting, because it was fairly recently restored and cleaned. Uh, and this gives a good idea of, about how these things aren't just one nice big piece of wood. Uh, all these planks, uh, basically, that, uh, you know, again, they, they, the wood warps a little bit, it pulls apart a little bit, and it, just all sorts of splitting and horrors goes on. So there's a, there's a ton of just conservation as well as restoration all combined together. Uh, but now it's, well, actually, it's interesting when they, every time you restore a work of art, people come out of the closet and say, oh, you ruined it. Because we're sort of somehow well, we're sort of used to seeing things the way they are. We kind of like them that way. When they come back being different, we're not quite ready for it. The best example would be the Sistine Chapel ceiling, which for years and years and years, for centuries, generations, was covered in yellow. Well, mostly just candle smoke. All the that was the lighting in there. There's virtually no windows. So it was all just you know fumes going up to the ceiling. So you could barely see it. And if you look at even slightly older. Uh, reproductions of it, or old movies that are taking place in there. You know, it's almost invisible. And then they cleaned it, and all these harsh, bright colours came out, and everybody said, "Ugh, yeah, that's really nasty." And you know, he must have, after he painted it, he must have sort of gone back over with something else and toned it all down a bit because it's just too sharp the colours. What oh, my God, did anybody do that? In fact, a lot of the colours come from his teacher, Dio, you know, from the fourteen sixties or so. Uh, so it's a probably natural progression, but Michelangelo has always been put down as a colorist because he didn't say he can draw, but he can't color, basically. And now everybody's got to review their opinions of Michelangelo because he's one of the most brilliant colorists of all time. But what's interesting is that I can't remember exactly when they reopened the cleaned up ceiling in the, it's probably about almost 20 years ago already. Then they did the Last Supper on the Apple, but it's already darkening down. Because the people who are the guys who are in there all the time, they actually notice, you know, we're uh, going to have to clean it again. And it's all just tourist breath. You know, if you could just put masks on people and get them to <gasps> when they go in, it might help. But you know, some of you might, there's famous caves in Europe called the Latin France called the Lascaux Caves, which have all these amazing mammoths. I mean, 25,000 years ago, it's one of the great examples of. Uh, of sort of caveman art, and they discovered them by some guy's dog fell through a hole and there were all these wonderful caves. 
So they, they opened them up for the tourists, and, and literally a few months later they had to shut them down because all this green slime was drying on. It, it lasted fine for 25,000 years. You put in 600 tourists a day and that was destroying it. So it's not just cars and buses and cows farting that they're destroying the planet. It's also us breathing, I'm afraid. So anyway, this one thing is called the Ambassadors, which is obviously isn't quite really the right title. Fifteen thirty three is actually the year after he gets back to England from Switzerland. So this is kind of England two, uh, the second stage. And again, I think it, he's painting a billboard as an advertisement for his skills because sadly there's no way that these two characters here deserve something quite as magnificent uh, as this. Um, certainly the titles we'll see in a second isn't all that accurate, the ambassadors. Because what we're looking at, the two chappies here are, on the left-hand side, uh, he's the one who actually bought and paid for the picture, apparently. Uh, his name is Jean de Danteville, D-I-N-T-E-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. If you Google the picture, just hold on about you'll get all this basic information. But um, The trouble is, again, is there's almost too much sort of added in that kind of only the select few would ever know, and it's partly the fault of the genius of the people now interpreting it, that they add in all the stuff that they know, and you wonder if Holbein could have ever known it. So, you know, maybe it's there, maybe it isn't. Anyway, John de Nantivy, uh, and he had a nice chateau in France, the, the picture was apparently painted to, to hang there, and he seems to have been sent over by the French king, Francis I, from the great rival of Henry VIII, uh, on, on some sort of a diplomatic mission. Maybe, or he might have almost been sent over as a kind of a spy, just to check up uh, and see what was happening. All of these divorce proceedings against Catherine of Aragon, the Spanish wife of the king, um, just to, just to check up the progress of all that sort of stuff. We, we just don't know. I mean, if you're a spy, you don't really write down stuff about what you're doing. Uh, but we know he's 29 years old, and that's actually written. No, I'm sure it's. I think it's on there. It's certainly on the hilt of the dagger. Somewhere in here, just saying he's 29 years old. But again, look at the pose, because he's striking this wonderfully arrogant pose. Uh, feet wide apart, one hand, actually not, well, not holding gloves, but with this rather relaxed, nonchalant kind of way. Uh, the other one holding the dagger. So again, I think that is, this is, if you like, the prototype for the eventual portrait of, of royalty. And again, the enormously wide shoulders, this, this extraordinary... Um, combination of all the materials and the textures which the northern artists just love to paint, again coming out of that sort of Van Anke tradition. And there's all, I mean, all of the things here mean something. He's got badges in his hat. I mean, if we had six hours, we could kind of list off every single tiny thing, but, you know, just be aware that everything is meaningful. I kind of like the idea, I mean, you would sort of slash through one layer of clothes and the next layer would you sort of put it through a tiny bit to not quite sure why, but I guess it was trendy at the time. Uh, so this is Jean de Dantivy. Uh, cap at a sort of ja jaunty angle. I mean, it's all to do with manly vigor and virility and everything else, basically, uh, to show who is the... Well, again, the idea of the, of the, the dagger in the hand. He's a cultivated man. It's, again, that sort of casual put, but also the knife, the big knife in his hand. Don't push him too far, somehow. But certainly a huge contrast with his friend on the on the right hand side, Georges de Selve. His name was D E, capital S E L V E, and he's actually twenty five. Uh, that is written just beside him. I think it's on the book. Yeah, see, right right on the book next to him. He's twenty five years old. Look at it hidden. Find it hidden there. Uh, and what he was, he'd see, he's dressed in clerical robes. And even though he's 25 years old, he's actually been bishop designate, in other words, not quite the bishop yet, but he will be soon, uh, of a place called Lavaur, L A V A U R, which is near Toulouse. It's in France. And he's been that, he's been this bishop designate since he was 20. And again, this was part of the chuck problem of the church. Every job was for sale. And if you were a wealthy family, and you had, I said this before, the first son, Inherits everything, second son, army, third son, church. So you're going to buy him a couple of bishoprics just to keep him going for his life. 20 years old. When you were three, you would get a big red hat, you were a cardinal. This sort of thing. So again, that had to be, I guess, 
uh, curtail to a certain extent. Uh, it took a while, and he seems to have been maybe perhaps on some sort of a secret mission to England. But again, if it was that secret, how do you know? So, that, but he might have been just visiting his friend, because they were pals, apparently. So that's why he's there. But again, you know, hardly justifying this wonderful uh, painting. So he is, again, this rather less self-assured pose. Again, they're almost prop, propping himself up on the, uh, the shelf unit that is sort of something out of Ikea that they've got piled up here with all the stuff on it. Uh, again, you would oh, hang on, where did he go? There we go. Um, again, again, you think of, I mean, sort of reverse Henry the Seventh, and you've sort of got um, uh, the, the, the bishop fellow, and so uh, a contrast between uh, the two there. I think, again, so Holman is kind of working things out that will be able to use perhaps more effectively or more significantly uh, later on. So, what Apart from just showing off his talents, why is Holbein painting this extraordinary image of these two very insignificant men? Because when you think even the Anolfini wedding, which was revolutionary and different and wonderfully full of all sorts of good stuff, uh, I mean, it was small, it was insignificant, you could walk past it and here, but this is life-size, sort of in-your-face, statement-sized, you might call it, uh, from that point of view. Because there's, a, there's an absolutely huge amount of information uh, that's piled up here. And again, every single thing, top to bottom, side to side, uh, means something and expands the significance of the picture. Years and years and years ago, I just had, I was lucky, I was in London, just when they had an exhibition, uh, they, they used this painting as the focal point. And what they did was London, you got all the amazing museums that you could find stuff. But I think virtually every single thing in the picture, they got the actual object. Even we'll see in a minute, there's a a math book down there, they found that actual book uh, and had it open at the page that it's opened in the painting. Could you stop rustling? Sorry about that, but it really pisses me off. Can I say that? I did. Uh, no, I, 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 I just take it out of the thing and just move on. Yeah! Thank you. And pick up the garbage on Oh, yeah. Um, see, now I'm to I've forgotten. Where am I? Oh, the book. I, mean, I have no idea what I'm talking about. The book. The what? The actual, oh, the exhibition. Yeah, no, the exhibition. Yeah, the pages of. They found that book. They got loops. They got carpets. That's that's. It. I mean, it's not quite the same carpet, but it's near enough. I mean, these were collectibles at this time. That they would bring them in from Turkey. Mostly, this is from Anatolia. Sort of about the right date, basically. And you put them on tables, you didn't put them on the floor, they were far too good. I think you even had to duck still lights and, and draw a picture, they always got the carpets on the floor. Uh, on the table rather, not on the floor. Because uh, they were just lovely. And so that's uh, kind of nice little bit there. And what even, what even the, I can't prove it, but even the floor is actually sort of modeled on close to the Cosmati style pavement in so it's in front of the high altar in Westminster Abbey. So the suggestion is they're standing on holy ground, uh, rather than just you know, hanging around the living room kind of thing. So in the very, very broadest sense, what Holbein seems to be illustrating here, and again, read, don't read too much because you just get utterly confused. Uh, it, it, some people think he's illustrating the seven liberal arts. And this is another good pub trivia question, name the seven liberal arts, because basically at the top you've got astronomy, uh, and then down at the bottom you've got arithmetic and geometry, music. Well, this is, see, now you've got a strategy of it that the two figures represent logic and grammar and rhetoric, if you're counting up all seven of the liberal arts. Uh, so again, spend a little bit on your own knowledge and learning how much you can bring to the picture. But what, as a, I mean, just as sheer art, I mean, the, here's the top shelf. Just covered with even the back cloth thing. That's absolutely wonderful the way that that's done. So here you've got all this accumulation of stuff, and it's all to do with astronomy. And if it looks a little bit familiar, it's because this most of this stuff he got from his chum, Nicholas Kratzer. We met him last. This is from England number one when he in the first trip to England. He did it in 1528. 
uh, and a fellow German who was sort of astronomer royal would be the title that it was a lot of the tools, uh, particularly that poly and type of thingy there, and all the other measuring bits and pieces that are going on. So that's clearly he got his friend in to act as a kind of a consultant uh, when he's putting all this stuff together. And I'm not, I'm not even going to list off what it is because I have no idea what it is, but, but just to point out the globe is a uh, celestial globe, it's a globe of the heavens, not of, of, of planet Earth, uh, basically. Uh, but there are all sorts, that's a calendar apparently. Uh, nah, it gets too weird. Um, on the bottom shelf, the lower shelf, uh, there's an earthly globe, and then the books and the musical instruments. And, and there's also more sort of measuring things, which that would be, that's arithmetic, that's geometry, I guess, this um, sort of square thing there. And I put that upside down because the globe is actually upside down in the paintings. So I'm not sure if we can zoom in and up because on the globe, yeah, I can't, I can't go in that. See, there's France. And I, th I think the only word written on France is this place, Pat. Policy, P-O-L-I-S-Y, which is where the fellow had his chateau. So it's kind of going home already in uh, the painting. Uh, so this, the arithmetic book is by a fellow called Peter Appian, A-P-P-I-A-N. And that was published in 1527. So it's a pretty new book, you know, six years old or so. Uh, the music book is, well, the, 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 what's, look, what we're looking at here, it's, it's a... Uh, a fellow called Johann Walter, W-A-L-T-H-E-R, and it's a hymn book. And it's open at the hymn, Veni Creator Spiritus, which we could all hum along, I'm sure. Uh, well, if we zoomed in, we could read the music, we could. If I was just, if I still taught at the Royal Conservative Music, they could all be just, <laughs> it's all very legible, as you can see. But what's interesting is actually, uh, Veni Creator Spiritus means come Holy Spirit, uh, this is actually um, a Lutheran hymn book. It's a, it's a translation that, that Martin Luther was involved in. So again, that's a little bit odd to have in this situation. But look, see, there's more kind of set squares. No, no, that's the set square, whatever that is, dividers and things, all the measuring stuff there. I mean, just probably has this wonderful bit of painting that's going on. I, mean, I was in, just in Ottawa at the weekend, I think I said before I left, that uh, the Caravaggio exhibition, which if you get a chance to get down to water, I think it's open for almost another month. I mean, it's really worth it. It's a wonderful show. But there was sort of a no-name painter who did it. Remember last time we were doing Dura and St. Jerome? And in fact, this was a, huge, it was a very large picture of St. Jerome in his study with a lovely little angel looking on. And actually, over at the right-hand side was a, a book of Dura engravings with a Madonna and child, uh, you know, painted beautifully. But I would I'm just sort of struck by the, the, the front ledge of the painting was this wonderful beaten up old gnarly bit of wood that people have sort of chewed on and just, I mean, again, you didn't have to do that. The whole foreground of the picture sort of took on value in its own right somehow. Anyway, that's, we've got math, now we've got music. We've also got the, well, we've got this amazing, just about the most beautiful loot ever painted. Remember last week, if you were here, the Dura, when I was, you know, his book of instructions, basically, how you do, how you paint a foreshortened loop. Remember, you look at it through the sort of grid thing, do it quite little square by little square, rather than trying to do it all at once. So you've got loop there, and you've got flutes, a bag of flutes uh, down there, just below it, and that gives you the sort of string and the wind, superior inferior kind of uh, contrast. So so far so good. Basically, what we seem to be looking at is a kind of catalogue of, well, where's the old sort of thing? Gone. Anyway, we're back in a second. Just of all sort of man's greatest intellectual achievements, uh, somehow. But when we look at it more carefully, we see, in fact, that this is Holbein's commentary on what might be even just a religious confusion that's got. You see, look up the curtain on the way back in the upper left hand corner, there's the crucifix, but it's actually hidden behind the curtain. So it's kind of, you know, have they turned their back on Christ? Have they rejected Christ by all the Lutheran sentiments and things like that? Don't know, uh, because he doesn't, unfortunately, write out the kind of uh, program that he's uh, kind of do. But all of this, you know, Europe is confounded at this time.
time, particularly in the north, by all of the, the new ideas that were coming out. And don't forget, he'd just come back from Basel. He's been there a few weeks ago, basically, where um, this was one of the sort of strongest Protestant centres in Europe. Now he's in England, which was also in the throes of this great breakaway from the church uh, in Rome. So crucifix uh, pushed away, ignored somehow. All of the instruments, and again, don't ask me how or why, but apparently all of the instruments here which are measuring things are all sort of slightly out of whack. They're not all kind of coordinated to tell the same time or measure the same distances to the stars, whatever it's supposed to be. So that, there's a kind of strangeness going on, on up there. Uh, Peter Appian's book is actually open to a page about division, you know, mathematical division, but also maybe religious division. Uh, the, even, I'm just told us, anyway, stupid things, the Sacco flutes, one of the flutes is sticking way out much further than the others, because people think that's kind of discord, disharmony somewhere in that little uh, area. Uh, but, and also the Lutheran hymn book is a pretty strange choice for a couple of good Catholic boys to have that on the table uh, in front of them. And the biggest give giveaway of the whole lot that something sort of strange is going on, if we look at the lute itself, and you have to really zoom in on this, because it, I mean, it's, a, trust me, it's a wonderful piece of painting to be able to do that. But look, ta-da! One string is broken. And in fact, the other end of the string dangles. Can you see it just, well, it might be clear. It just dangles down over the ledge. And again, love, another lovely little bit of trompe-l'oeil stuff, sort of drawing it out. And that, that little, the edge of the sex square thing there also sticks out, throws a shadow down, little in your face there. But that little, sort of drawing attention to itself, the broken string there. And see, it's not nearly, you probably didn't even notice it on that detail. You have to zoom in a bit there. But anyway, it's gone, it's broken, it's busted. So immediately the lute, which we've seen in the sort of hierarchy of instruments, which is sort of therapeutic and harmonious and, and sort of soothing and all sorts of things. Now it represents disharmony, discord, because it's broken. And that immediately, now you've got to go back and look up the entire image, basically, and see it not so much in the positive light, but uh, again as a kind of massive vanitas uh, a symbol, a, a kind of visual sermon, basically, against sin such as pride, pride in learning, pride in all the various arts, None of these, again, the idea of a vanitas, vanity of vanity, all is vanity, nothing adds up to a hill of beans on judgment day. Only sort of divine knowledge, learning, uh, matters then. Uh, the only true source of knowledge, of course, is God himself. And this is kind of sidetracking, I guess, from that idea. So everybody gets confused, as they are supposed to be, by this blobby thing. Have you all been wondering what that is? Some of you, I bet you know it already. So, anyway, it's kind of good. What it is, it's an anamorphic image. A N A M O R P H I C. Which is kind of, I mean, it was actually sort of almost a specialized art form, and you would do these extraordinary distorted images in a big site, and then you put a highly polished cylinder in the middle of it, and the reflections would all be pulled in, and they would look right. So, Obviously, it took ages and ages to figure that sort of thing out. But this thing here, uh, if, if, this, is, this is actually a portrait of Edward VI, the one and only, one and only son of, of, of Henry VIII. And obviously, it's, it's extraordinary to sort of like that. It's in the National Portrait Gallery in London. It's quite big. You know, it has to be four or five feet long or so. Uh, and actually, it's in a plexiglass case. And it sort of directs you to go around to the far end, and you look at there's a little hole in the plexiglass just to make sure you look at it in the right place. And so when you do that, it looks like that. So everything else, the landscape, everything else gets sort of, but now the face of Edward the, 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 the sixth is okay. And that's the same sort of thing that's happening here. When you look at it from the right angle, which is an extremely extreme angle, then everything kind of makes sense. This is a, a, no idea, a nice lady doing the right thing, sort of backing it up. You have to look exactly down there. And after the lecture, I'll leave it up. You can come up and you can either look at it, you know, you have to get almost your face up against the wall. And then you look at it either from the, the sort of bottom corner or if you're tall enough, no, you're not, 
Or you can stand on a chair and look at it from the top. The world goes away. And when you do that, uh, it looks like this. Oh, that's cool. And this, I hope it's not the real picture because it's out in the street, but uh, they, they do that in London. They have these wonderful reproductions of these great paintings all, all around the city. Uh, and so here is the, uh, the image. And that, I don't know if that's even more helpful. I just found out that. So you're looking down at that. But anyway, it's a, there it is. So everything else now is distorted, and what you see is uh, what he wants you to see. So again, this anamorphic uh, image. And, I mean, it really is quite a good... Uh, it's, it's a clever thing to do it that way, because it's, when it ends up and the, seeing it from the right angle, it really is extraordinarily really realistic. But what this is, it, it, it's... Whenever you see the skull, it's a memento mori, a reminder of death. And again, the idea of transients that were basically we're all going to die. So it's pretty cheerful stuff uh, as usual. But it also the transients of all of man's achievements, all of the music, the learning, the books, the, uh, the stars, everything is, you know, our knowledge of them, everything is insignificant. <clears throat> Apparently, well, it's been suggested, I don't actually quite believe it, that it was designed, the whole thing was designed to be, to be sort of hang on a, on a, on a staircase in the fellow's chateau, so that you would see it going, you know, coming down in the morning, you'd be a reminder you were going to die, and you'd see it going back up to bed at night, that you were closer to death. Somehow. But if, if it were like that, he would literally have had to stop and press his ear up against the wall, coming and going to get the message. So I don't think it's quite necessary like that way, but it, it, it certainly could have been. Um, it's actually the Memento Mori was actually the personal, big gloomy that as well, of, of Jean de Dandeville, it was sort of on his coat of arms. And there is actually, I think it's that one there, it's a little bit hard to see, there's a, uh, a skull on his cap, just again as part of the sort of family emblem. It's a lot of a nice face though, isn't it? It's just sort of boom. And again, all the different textures all around it there. Uh, so I think this is a really good example of a picture that you can enjoy it from all sorts of different levels. I mean, you can just go out and look at it and go, wow, jeez, that's amazing. And then, again, it's the more you know, the more you get. And it, a little bit of knowledge is good. As I say, it, it's one of those things that the, the overly smart people get their teeth into and rather wring the life out of it. Like, you know, once you get really sucked into all the meanings, you rather forget the wow factor that you should be just going, wow. Oh, and that's, I hope, throughout this course I've been teaching you a little bit about how to go, oh, when you look that up. Now, I, I thought I would end up, uh, just to show you what I could be talking about all the time. I found this the other day, I have no idea what this guy is saying. This Art history has become unbelievably sort of esoteric. Every discipline, I think, from medicine to hockey, whatever, invent its own language so that nobody else can now understand what you're talking about. So this is this is some guy, so you can dose on that. Luke Lake Lakin, whoever the hell he is, uses the Holbein painting to illustrate this illustrate the split, the Freudian Spaltum, induced by the encounter of a signifier with the real. See this I mean what what is a signifier? Do you, do you guys all know this? Don't you get taught this? You do you know what a signifier is? Yeah. No. <laughs> Okay, well, don't try and tell me because I don't want to know. Um, yeah, in Lakin's ontology, of, actually, I don't know what ontology is, of the subject, this traumatic encounter precipitates the subject in relation to the eccentric object hyphen cause. Bracket, it may help to think, it may help to think of the subject as a form approaching the split from the side of the signifier, and the object hyphen cause as a form approaching the split from the side of the real, thus only cognizable by the subject in fantasy. In the field of the visible, the, the object clause hyphen takes the form Lakin calls the gaze, in quotes, our fleeting awareness of an eye which seems to look back, watching us, as it were, from outside the field of vision. In Lakin's interpretation, the skull blot of the Holbein portrait signifies the fundamental relation of, of, of obliquity upon the subject's assertion that his existence is sustained even though the subject is incapable of cognizing that relation. And in brackets, four fundamental con concepts, pages 88 to 89, in case you want to go into that. In this sense, the distorted skull is the residual trace of a species of knowledge which is impossible for the conscious subject and which may be approached only at the boundary of the visual hyphen imagery 
order of subjectivity. I have to thank you. I mean, you should be grateful for me that I don't do that stuff at you because a lot of teachers do and they think they're so bloody clever for coming up with all these big words. It makes me feel very ignorant, but it also makes me feel happy to be ignorant because I just honestly don't want to know. So, anyway, that's, that's enough of that. So, we'll just spend, and this will be a nice early day for you. Uh, we'll spend the rest of the time just sort of reviewing quickly ish uh, what we're going to do. And uh, again, I should emphasize that the exam we've decided will start at 10 o'clock. I better write that down or I'll forget. I, I might show up early. Um, so, and I'll, I'll put it on my courses so that there's no question. 10 a.m. And it's Friday, it's Friday, isn't it? Now, I should also just say when I'm thinking about it, that, that I picked up the essays from the TA who was just about to leave on holiday. So even if you've handed in your essays now, I can't get it to her until Friday. So I'm not exactly sure how I get things back to you. Um, how? You can give it to the Liberal Studies Office. They'll they, take them? They hold on to it. Would they? So, yeah. In a little box. Okay, because usually they don't want to be involved. In that. No, they, they keep it for a they while and then they just Then they just shred it. Because they're not going to keep a yeah, bunch of no. essays from every class. Yeah. Okay, well that's good to know. So I'll, I'll, again, I'll let you know when, when and if I've put them there. So if, if, you, if you need to get it back, you can do that. But exa don't get exams you never get back. Unless you want to petition your final mark and then... First of all, it costs you 75 bucks or something. Uh, and then you gotta, we've got to go through all sorts of horrors. Yeah? What if someone has to examine one day? Because you had it on, you had it on 8 or 30, right? But I have so, so what was it? Start, start again? Um, I heard that you guys have, you have the exam at 10 o'clock, right? Yeah. But I have one more exam at 12 o'clock, 2, 3, and I have to You have another exam at 12 o'clock? And I have to go to... Okay, so now we'll go back to 9.30. 9.30? Yeah, and so the exam will be an hour and a half at the moment, so you'll be out of here by 11. Okay. Because, I mean, the exam should last from 8.30 to 11.30, so you've still got a better deal at the other. So back to 9.30, guys. That's plan A anyway. They really pack your ear. And again, I can't understand why they do that. Why, did, why can't we just have our Wednesday slot and do it on Wednesday when you're all used to coming here? <coughs> no, it's too, I'm just going to think maybe I can get away with doing that. It's too late to organize. Particularly since I'm the one in here. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, the, exam, the final exam is basically the same format. As I said, that was part of the point of the midterm, was just to teach you the, um, the way I do these things. So we would start with the, the, you know, there's a part one, two, three. Start with part one, which is the ID thing. Everything is on the highlight sheet. Um, basically nothing that's not in capital letters would be on the exam. So that narrows things down a lot. Uh, so part one just... Quick, quick, flexing muscle, warming up. Uh, part two, again, is very similar. There might, I, I, I don't, there might be comparisons. I do like comparisons, so there might be comparisons. Uh, but it might be just, because we've seen some hugely important works that you, know, you can certainly write for 20 minutes about. And, and again, we were talking a bit last time about the, the amount of time for each section. And I think 20 minutes each is, is a good time. So. That should give you enough to tell me yeah, pretty well everything you know, but then at the end you can have a little bit of extra time if you know even more. But I, I always just feel bad for the people who have told me everything you know in five minutes, and then they're just sitting staring at the ceiling for the rest of the time. So the trick is to learn lots, and then you won't get yourself bored. And also I should remember that, that if you're an ESL student you can bring a dictionary. But it has to be a little book dictionary, not a little digital one that if I see you you know, googling things, then you would immediately be, re be removed from OCAD. OCAD U, sorry. Um, and can I just also say a little bit about the, because the whole thing having just mentioned OCAD U, about the essays, a, a frightening number of you didn't bother to read the instructions, you didn't bother to go to the library and learn how to write an essay in the technical way, you didn't go to the learning and writing and learning centre to get help there. So you lost a lot of marks. In fact, you lost 10 marks, which the, through the generosity of the TA and or me, 
uh, you could, if you make up the proper bibliography and do the things in an academic way, you can get those ten marks back. But again, if you want, if I, I just I have to say this almost every time. A lot of you come here thinking you're just coming to an art school, and you're not. You're coming to something that thinks it's a university, however foolish that may be. And that a university like academies, they've got all their rules and regulations. They've got the right way to do everything, and it's very pedantic to my my way of thinking. It's the guaranteed to stifle creativity and imagination. Is, is this thing still on? Am I still being? Okay, I can turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just as well that this is my last lecture because otherwise it would be anyway. Probably. But I mean, I, can't, I don't agree with any of it. But that, it's, that's the rule, you know, and you're here. And if, so, if any of you just want to learn to draw and paint and, and do other little creative, creative thing, you might actually be better off somewhere else because all it does is create stress when you're having to write these essays. And this is just second year. Imagine this is pretty much the beginning of the thing. By the time you get farther on, it's going to get harder and harder, and people will be even more pedantic when you get there. So anyway, not to depress you too much, but you might, you know, a little reality check maybe. Uh, but you do, have, you do have to follow the, the party line, basically. So back to the exam. Again, again there's nothing that, that uh, different, as I said. It's just really the choice of things. Now, I can't even remember exactly when the, the on the midterm exam, because 90% of the final exam, 99% in fact, is from the, after the midterm, but it's supposed to cover the whole course, so uh, if in certain questions you can refer back to earlier stuff, that sort of gets bonus marks, maybe. I have to remember to tell the TA that. Uh, so, Basically, did, did we get to Hugo van der Hoos in the middle? I don't think so. I think it was just before him. So we, we start with Hugo. Hugo van der Hoos. No, 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 I forget that. We started hot. Oh, no, okay, we start with, all right, we start with Memling. So the only thing with Memling in Campbell's is the shrine of St. Ursula. So that's a sort of part one ID question, maybe. Because, I mean, he's really good, but he's not. Because again, I'm just sort of looking at things that are so important. So with Hugo, important areopathies, that's the main one. Uh, maybe I'll just go flash things up and refresh your memories a little bit. Uh, and and every, every time, again, just a sort of general reminding to us that not to just scribble away like man. Have a little think before you start writing. Uh, too much, uh, and, and the main thing, again, not to bring in the wings, but the main thing here, the, the altarpiece, the central panel, and, and the, 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 a lot of the significance about this, of course, is the interest in it in particular, is that it, it, it's a northern picture, but it was brought down to Italy, and just kind of blew away all these little backward Italians, while well, they're all busily having a renaissance and thinking about Greece and Rome, and suddenly, boom, all the, particularly as I point out, these shepherds just knock people's socks off. Because nobody, ever, and they probably, most people would have disapproved, because sort of like Caravaggio in the 17th century, all that realism, oh, don't like that. You know, everybody has to have clean feet uh, when they worship the Christ child. Uh, and now you get a sense of us, a connection to our world rather than everything being remote and different. But you have to add in, if, if this came up, you'd have to add in all the symbolism, everything from. Joseph with his shoes off. And don't, don't forget, he's got a bit more virile, hasn't he, than the usual little sort of hobbling around guy. So the column. I mean, you just basically describe things you go around. Remember the palace of David in the background with the harp above the door, the, the legend that the nativity, the birth of Christ, took place in the ruins of the palace and all the architectural symbolism, ruins of one order, gives way to the the new order brought in by the birth of Christ, the flower symbolism, all these amazing angels who cluster around, who represent the sort of hierarchy of angels, but also the hierarchy of the, the church on earth. So, I mean, you, you, again, what you talk about in all of these things, you talk about the, a little bit about the medium, and that usually is oil, but that allows, of course, all the wonderful detail that comes out. Uh, you talk about the subject matter, the straightforward subject matter, in this case the nativity, the adoration of the rather scrawny looking little Christ child. And remember, even the, the wheat, that's symbolic, remember? Bethlehem, where he's born, means house of bread, and, the, and you go from bread to the body of Christ in the Eucharist. 
Um, and then, then they're kind of a catalogue of all the symbols. So it's medium style content subject matter in every single case. And if you get stuck, a little bit of biographical thing about the article, there's always a with Hugo, it's interesting that he went crazy. So we think. So that's pretty good. Now, again, we can... I think what because it shouldn't take more than, say, 20 minutes to go through all of this, because you, I know you've got more amazing memory. So we won't have a sort of break and come back. We'll just do it, and then we'll be done. So with Bosch, obviously, again, you look at the highlight sheet and the um, specific images, the, the major altarpieces. Which did I do for an adoration of the Magi, which would be that one. Um, I, again, I think, well, to be honest, but with Gardner, Mouth and Delights, that's such the major superstar. That I think any, either one of these, the Nativity or the, where did you go, the Hayway. Um, that, I mean, these are sort of more number one questions, I think. But again, you can refer to them. Sideways, but the, the, the main one obviously would be the Garden of Mercy and Delights because that's the one of the great superstars in, in Western art. And, and so you would, uh, if it were on, I would probably put up the whole thing that you could describe. And remember, remember that's where again you can refer to other ones because you know the same format of paradise, earth, hell. What I was talking, remember what I was saying that, that with with most last judgment kind of scenes, there is a at least a hope of getting on the winning side of things after death. But uh, with Bosch, everybody goes to hell basically because we just screw around, we have too much fun in the middle part. So the promise of life basically because this is the creation of Eve. Uh, but then also if you remember all these weird hybrid creatures, the kind of perversion of divine will that comes out there. Um, then all of the, this extraordinary variety of Sinning in all of it. I mean, if any of you want to, if, 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 you if you're not sinners yet, and you want to know how, right, I mean, just just look at this picture. I mean, it's like a textbook of all this. And, I mean, first of all, you've got to get some good creatures to maybe to write, and that would, that would be good to do some of that. But there's some there's some positions and poses, and, and um, it's all a lot of group stuff going on. If you if you've got a few like-minded friends, racial uh, intermingling. I love thinking, I mean, that's such an amazing object thing. There. It's almost like that, who is it? That, who's, the, who's the dancing Hindu? Shiva, is it Shiva? Shiva. Yeah, I mean, it's a lovely pre-Shiva. I mean, Shiva probably looked at that and thought, wow, that looks cool. I think I'll stick my arms out. <laughs> Good, isn't it? And then you can play with birds. I mean, just this normal stuff. Fun. That's tricky, yeah. And that, that's, I mean, some of it would, uh, that's not to be recommended. But that's it. Uh, and a huge fruit as well, that's always good. So, anyway, I mean, you just, you can have a lot of fun there. So, I mean, the point obviously again is so, and whatever, whatever the various interpretations are, and there are at least 4,000, uh, that, you know, are the punishment of sin of. All the seven deadly sins are what's going on in the in the, in the right hand wing, and even that you'd have to describe a little bit what's going on there, the symbolism of some of the figures. So that's a sort of good one to write about. Again, not so much technique there, but um, just Bosch's imagination for being able to run through this. I mean, you you really do wonder if he wasn't absorbing some sort of um, noxious substance. I don't think people with normal minds can be this clever, can they? I think you need help. Or maybe he was just really lonely out in the countryside somewhere, so just things happen that way. Anyway, whatever it is, you should know basically what's going on there. Bruegel, I didn't, I didn't, I mean, Bruegel is so lovely that, because he's unique, as I said, with all, most of the other art, not to be perhaps so much with, with Bosch, but you, you play art history snap and you line them up in the whole kind of cavalcade of historical. Uh, mumbo jumbo, and Bruegel just kind of, he's, he's his own guy, and you don't really think, oh ho, 16th century, and you, you, 
just look at them, enjoy them. And things like, uh, obviously, the printer one, but I didn't put them in capital, so technically I can't um, show them at all, but the children's games, for example. I mean, that's just, I mean, it's a whole different way of looking at art, really, isn't it? Because it's all about looking and sort of inching your way around and, and accumulating all the little bits and pieces that it gives you, rather than just sort of one big boom of a sort of instant colour field. Again, just being in Ottawa, they've got that extraordinary barn and human of the three stripes that are about 80 feet high or something, which a uh, huge fast when you were bought for millions some years ago. It's actually an extraordinary striking thing. But I mean, what I'm not to get on too much of a ramble, but I mean, the, the problem I have with that is that you look at it and basically that's it, it's done. You know, I don't want to come and look at it again tomorrow because I've seen it. And that's probably my fault rather than anything else, but I feel no urge whatsoever to go back again. With good art, I can't get enough looking at it. You always want to look at it. Every time you look at it, you see something different. Whenever I look at that part of human, I'm just going to see the same, the same three stripes. So, to me, that's enough. Uh, but with this stuff, on and on and on, just look at all the... And it, it's very sort of trivial and anecdotal, and, but it's sort of nice. Uh, so anyway, but the ones I did put in capital letters are the, the that well everything of the of the final the the, the peasant wedding the peasant dance uh, and all the landscapes which are so amazing and, and again you have to remember with all of these you have to be a little bit of a the art historian and put them into the context well not that context I mean I mean why are these things so good so important why are they so different. Uh, what came before, what came after, but did they influence later artists? But I mean, what is so? This, this is there's, there is no precedent for this whatsoever. This is a, a, a merchant in Antwerp who who gets together with Bruegel, saying, "Wouldn't it be good to have?" I mean, these are maybe the guys who crash the weddings and actually witness the events. You know, do me some really big pictures about a bunch of peasants. I mean, nobody would have thought of that up until this time. So it's the it's the innovation, the novelty. I mean, nowadays we almost take novelty for granted because it's got to be new and different and you have to reinvent yourself every other Tuesday to be interesting. And at this time, obviously, that wasn't a factor. Uh, but the, the, the idea of these things being so one-off, basically, and really nobody caught on to landscape many person. Because I think still the, the, the most extraordinary one and the most innovative ones are the... Um, the actual landscape scene, which are, don't forget, our kind of calendar, calendar illustrations, if you like, like, all the way back to the, uh, the Duke of Berry manuscript I showed at the very beginning of the course, uh, but harvesting, not, I'm not, it's funny, I'm not so keen on that one, so I don't know why, it doesn't, doesn't quite seem to fit. Uh, but this one of the, the gloomy day, the dark day, the, the capturing of the mood of nature, which is so wonderful. And then Return of the Herd, again, sort of miserable and cold and horrible, but still, you know, it's sort of man and nature together. And it's always very cosmic, I mean, the huge sky and the magnificent panoramic view of the landscape. Nobody had thought about doing that sort of thing before. And my, my favourite, just because it's Canadian, I guess, this marvellous view of, again, He's almost gone back to his, remember the earliest, early stuff, when he went way high up in the air, so that the horizon line is right at the top of the picture, so that you get this huge, the, the bigness of nature coming out. And similarly here, we've gone up a little way, we don't even know what we're standing on, doesn't really matter. And we just gaze across this wonderful landscape, all snow and the fire and the people zooming around on the ice. It's good stuff. So that's good old Bruegel. Uh, Grunewald, obviously, the, the one and only work really with him is the Isenheim altarpiece. See, I'm, I'm having trouble because there's a, I think in part two, there'll be three things to write. In the, in the midterm, which was shorter, the, there was only um, two, uh, which, both of which had to. So I think in this case, the, 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 the final had to be three. And there's still too many amazing things for me to squeeze everything in, so you should learn about everything and then just hope that you hit the ones that I hit on. Uh, and so the principal scene with the isn't home would be that. So again, see, here's a really good example when you have to talk about context of things, a little bit about Grunewald himself perhaps, but about the 
monastery, the hospital bed that this thing was created for. So as, a, as we saw, it's very much part of the healing process that poor old sickos would look at this. And most of the saints that we saw in it were all saints that were invoked if you had particular diseases. So this is a... Um, it's therapeutic, I guess you could say. Not quite the Roman Rajay, but I showed you that one again, the, the, the last judgment that was in the, the poor house in Bloom. Uh, not quite the same, because that, at least again, sort of, um, well, it was just sort of, you know, a, a reminder of you better behave yourself from now on. And this, I think, is more of a sort of consolation, if you like, because all the horrible suffering, remember that ghastly creature, all suppurating sores in the corner of one of the images, and now Christ himself almost torn apart on the cross, this, this uh, physical anguish, agony from top to bottom basically. Uh, your suffering is nothing compared to that. Plus he's suffering from all of you, all of mankind, and you're just you know, doing it for yourself. So get over it. And I'm not sure if it would totally work for me, but um, that's, that was the idea, along with whatever other things. They, remember ergot poisoning, things like that, that people were eating bad bread and the sort of virtual plagues, and they would give you forced good food into you, plus all these other sort of herbal remedies that they had. So you cannot remove this. I mean, as I said, we sort of look at it as a work of art, perhaps, uh, but they wouldn't have seen it that way, I don't think. It would be much more. You know, part of the cure. And, and it's, so everything expressive, distorted, contorted, expressionist. As I said, there's nothing really like this until German expressionism in the 20th century, of that kind of savagery. So that's one that you might be also thinking about. Yeah. Can I just ask a question on the highlight sheet? Yes. Yeah. Did, I, did, that, did you catch my deliberate mistake? Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite uh, well, no, no, hang on, because the, that's the, that's no. the, the I was, I guess, I was sort of conflating a little bit that, that I mean, Anthony and because again, you'd have to sort of describe what you're not looking at, perhaps, which is the other openings, yeah. uh, and that's the remember that, that that's the Anthony and Paul. Where's where's it? Oh, there's the. the the smelly guy. Uh, um, there's the two together. That, there's Anthony. There's the temptation of Saint Anthony. Yeah, those are those are that's the that's the third position. Okay, that okay, that's the first one. That's the, that's opening one. The sculpture thing, flanked by blah blah blah. And then the adoration. No, I think. Well, oh no, you're right. No, I did. You are. You know, aren't you smart? Bonus marks for you. No, I did, I did make a horrible mistake, didn't I? Yeah, I did. uh, it is. Because I, I don't know why I keep thinking that that is John the Baptist. I mix him up with him doing the point point thing. No, that's St. Sebastian. So it's flanked by Anthony and St. Sebastian, or St. Sebastian and Anthony, mm -hmm. with the lamentation underneath. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist in there, John the Evangelist there, so you've got everybody necessary, and Mary Magdalene, of course. Well done. I, I'm, I'm just testing to see if anybody was paying attention. When, if you ever become a teacher and you ever make a mistake, you can always say that and see if people believe you. I doubt if they will. Anyway, so that's, and again, you would just yeah, fill in all the gaps as far as the information that's provided here. I mean, don't forget the obvious thing I've said a thousand times is that 93% of the people this time can't read. So these are the visual aids, basically. You need the picture form of things to get the message across. Um, I mean, literacy is becoming more and more, particularly after the invention of printing, you know, more people start to learn to read. But even women occasionally. Uh, but until this point, virtually nobody could. It was, it was confined to priests, monks, monks. As I think I said, I mean, most kings would never bother to learn how to read or write. They had people to do that for them. So, it's almost a luxury in a way. So that's good old Grunewald. 
I am. Now, Dura, again, see, Dura is so amazing, so huge that, again, what could we do with him? I, I, again, there's quite a few on, in capital letters that I put which could be um, part one stuff. And again, you could refer to them in other situations. But I mean, things like the 1500 self portrait, that's pretty good. Or, I mean, that, that's a could be a part two or three that you could write for an hour and a half about that one, couldn't you? Uh, or that, I kind of like that one, where he's the, the peacock guy. Um, he just loves himself, doesn't he? Because he's so sexy. All the sensual leaves in his hair do and everything. Jeez. Uh, so anyway, that's that. But the important ones, again, sort of, well, I, I, I mean, I'm so biased, as I keep saying, that uh, I do love the, the works on paper by Dura more than the, uh, the paintings usually. So things like, well, um, the absolutely crucial ones, I think, would be... Uh, when did we get to last time? Well, I ended up here. That three-way image of the melancholy... I, I, think, I don't think... I mean, melancholy one, if, if you know about it, you can write for two hours. But it's so complicated and difficult. Did you all rush home and try out the look up a bit more about the Magic Square? It's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? Did, did anybody check out more about it? Yeah. You did? I thought you did. I really don't understand. What did? I don't really understand. No, it's just too it's too clever. And I don't know if he invented it or stole it from maybe some Arabic friend perhaps. Because remember the Arabs or the, or the Moors, whatever you want to call them, are the ones who they would they sort of kept all the mathematical but remember, in case you weren't here last week, remember, this is the, uh, there are a, a, um, 16 square. Each side, everything adds up to 34. I mean, it's uncanny. So the, every line adds up to 34, the individual lines. Diagonals, then this, the corner squares. There are, I can't remember now, it was 80, I think it was 86 different ways that you can add up to 34. Uh, the, if you take you know, the second from the, the left, so take that one, that one, that one, that one, and then the next one, right? I mean, just on and on and on. There's no way of not getting uh, 34. But it, I think almost cleverer down at the bottom, remember, uh, 1514, so that's the date of the print. And then A, number one is A, number four is D, so he's got his sort of initials there as well. Remember that started at 1514 AD. Well, let's just see what else we can do. So it's like Sudoku, whatever it is, gone man. Uh, but that again, that, what that shows is that Dura is smarter than most of us, and so it's that sort of off-putting. Is when you look at something like this, you feel like a moron because uh, you have no idea what's going on. And it's very much sort of 16th century knowledge, I guess, that is being brought out. But I think I think the two easier ones, in some ways, to a certain extent, are Night, Death, and the Devil and Saint Jerome. I mean, these are the Sort of best of the best, I think. Uh, and got, I mean, all the, this is a good comparison, actually, to have. I mean, the idea of all these sort of divisions that we've seen between the the active and the passive, uh, or the active and the contemplative, I should say, right? That one is more the passive. You can remember the idea of melancholia locked in place, can't move, can't think, can't do. Um, the distinction between disegno interno inspiration and disegno esterno. You're in it. Uh, this one's just used to. So the idea of, because as I said, Dura is stuck himself, writes about it. You know, I, I have a hard time getting it out of my head on the paper or wherever, um, as does everybody else. So, I, but I do think a little bit more straightforward are this champion, who was sort of the knight in shining armor, the Christian armor. He also represents, I think, a kind of new humanistic learning, which there's nothing like ignorance to get you scared of everything around you, but if you're smart and you're intelligent, then all of the boogie men and ghosties and satanic nasty things, things that go bump in the night, you can rise above them somehow. So that idea of the, of the dark impenetrable background, almost as much as we saw with the Adam and Eve before, which was sort of the boogie men place. Uh, now you can sort of rise above that. And then my favourite of the whole lot is good old Saint Jerome. Um, so comfortable in his 
his right world, I guess you might put it, because it's all about divine contemplation. I, re I really do wish I was holy sometimes, because it'd be nice to be like this, but it's such a safe world. But, and, and, and it's a sort of an acceptance of the inevitability of, of because there's all these reminders of death all over the place. And that's okay, because <laughs> you're going on to the better place. And that sort of thing. So with something like this, obviously, when you'd have to reel off all of the bits and pieces of the symbolism, not to sort of list off them again, uh, but also talk about the technique. And, and talk about Dura himself as the great innovator. So we saw what he did, he did watercolor the way that nobody else did it, he did woodcuts. And not only did he do them, but he, within a year or two, he went from sort of, again, little stick figures and, mm -hmm. you know, carving out of a piece of wood to the most unbelievably sophisticated thing. And then he takes engraving, which other people did a bit, and he made that better than anybody else almost ever was able to do it. So that's where he is magic man somehow. So you have to also talk about the idea of his uh, technical brilliant cleverness, more so, I mean, in all of them, like the, the whole thing we're just looking at, you have to talk about how beautifully it's done, the, the idea of craftsmanship, the skill level, which might be a little bit of a lost art nowadays, because it's just too much like hard work, isn't it? So, any other questions? Everybody all right? So if, you, if, you, if you really suck, just email me, but remember, email me with the phone number so I can give you a call so I don't have to bother typing to you. Um, and don't leave a voicemail. I said at the very beginning of this call, I haven't checked my voicemail at OCAN since 1983, I think it was. So uh, Now I'm scared to do it because there's probably 7,000 messages, so I'm just going to delete a lot of them. Um, but just my... my home phone number where you've got so shall I give it to you again just in case six four seven three four three one four one one. Oh I shouldn't have done that should I because now you're all gonna phone me. <laughs> no you're supposed to send me your phone number so that I can call you. Anyway, whatever works. So again I should just also say quickly about the essays that uh, because there's still, if, you, if you haven't picked it up yet, please do that now. The new ones I got, I think there's still one person that I didn't get anything from. Is that possible? I haven't. Hello? Who? I could have been doing this at you all the time. Keep you awake. Uh, who was it? I've also developed this horrible thing in my eye. I found this, it's called a floater. And I hope none of you have got one of those yet. It's this great shape that it's like I'm living inside a lava lamp. So I can't see anything. I think it just happened last week, hasn't it? So I can't read the name of the person who hasn't had it yet. But you should know. It's somebody with an unpronounceable name. P. Beginning with P. That initials MP. Pieris or something? Don't know if you're here or not. Anyway, if you've got any other questions about your essays, you could also just, I mean, either, either right now if you want them, or just save them and ask me on, on Friday. 9.30, again, I'll put it on the, uh, on my courses just to remind you all. No, you know.